Welcome everybody to today's Eggs and Issues. I'm Jack Llewellyn with the Durango Chamber of Commerce. And again, thank you so much for uh, participating. We have a lot of uh, uh, ballot initiatives on this year's ballot, 11 of them total from Colorado, as well as uh, here locally in Durango. Uh, we have 4A, which is the uh, uh, 9R school district. But thank you everybody for being here. And again, thank you to all of our panelists for participating. Um, how the rundown will go, I will introduce the individuals. The, the order will be Proposition 113, which is the national popular vote. Then we'll go with Amendment B, the Gallagher reform, and then Proposition 118, paid family medical leave. Uh, on Proposition 113, Jill Patton, it will be presenting for. Uh, Rose Puglisi will be presenting against. And then Amendment B, we have Simon uh, Lomack, and then Alex, uh, he is for, and Alex Lemel is uh, against. And then Proposition 118, we have Deborah Brown and uh, Karen Mulhaven. And I hope I, I think I may have messed that up, but, and uh, for, and then Christy Pollard against. Uh, each organization or presenter will have eight minutes. You will hear me say, 30 seconds as we get uh, close to wrapping up and then that eight minutes, I will say uh, wrap up. I will interrupt you. Um, you can, as participants in the uh, uh, chat room, you can put questions if you have any questions and we will allow questions um, uh, at the end of each segment presentation. And then we're actually gonna do a poll where we'll ask you, are you for, against, or still undecided? Um, don't see anything in the chat just right now. So with that, um, I will uh, let Jill Patton uh, be our first presenter for Proposition 113 and the National Popular Vote. And Jill, have you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. And again, thank you for being here. And we'll have you unmute and we will get started with today's eggs and issues. Oh, you'll have to unmute. Maybe our moderator in the background, because we're still not hearing you. Tracy or Diane, oh, there we go. Got it, okay, sorry about that. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jill Patton, and I'm a longtime member of the League of Women Voters. And though we are, as an organization, completely nonpartisan, when it comes to parties and candidates, we do take positions on issues. We support Proposition 113, and I hope to explain to you this morning why we think you should vote yes on Proposition 113. First, the proposition itself, as it will appear on your ballots, shall the following act of the General Assembly be approved, an act concerning adoption of an agreement among the states to elect the President of the United States by national popular vote, being Senate Bill 14-042. So this is actually all about how we elect our president. Some background on the bill that was referenced there. It means that Colorado joins other states in supporting the idea that the president should be elected by the majority of voters in the whole country. It was passed last year by the legislature and signed by Governor Polis on March 15, 2019. However, people opposed to its passage collected enough signatures to put it on this ballot, asking voters to weigh in on whether or not this is a good idea for Colorado. A yes vote keeps the bill as Colorado law, a no vote rescinds it. Background on why this bill came up in the first place. As you know, the founding fathers set up the electoral college to determine the winner of every presidential election. One of the main reasons they did this was to give the Southern states a more equal say in electing the president, which was helped keep them in the union since the Northern states with their higher populations could have outvoted them. As part of this, the constitution allowed each state legislature 
to determine how their electors are chosen and how they vote. Right now, all but two states, Maine and Nebraska, require that all their electors vote for the candidate who won the popular vote in that state. And the number of electors for each state equals the number of congressional districts in that state. So Colorado has nine congressional districts and therefore nine electors. That all makes sense. Um, okay, so five times in US history and twice in the last 20 years, George Bush Jr. versus Al Gore in 2000 and Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton in 2016, this electoral college system has determined that the candidate who lost the national popular vote actually won the presidency. So starting in about 2001, people across the country who were maybe understandably unhappy with that and wanted to make changes, started trying to come up with a solution. The obvious solution would be to change the constitution to eliminate the electoral college, dismissing it as an institution that no longer serves the purpose for which it was designed. Discussions were held as to what might be the best solution and rather than attempt the arduous and time consuming process of amending the constitution and having it ratified by the states, they decided to set up what is now called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, NPVIC for short. That is what Colorado signed on to last year. States which join this compact agree that they will have all their electors vote for the winner of the national popular vote rather than their state's popular vote winner, as now. However, this only goes into effect once enough states have joined the NPVIC for their cumulative electoral college votes to total a majority of all the electoral college votes cast. Then since the total of all their votes is a majority of the electoral college, the outcome is that the winner of the national popular vote wins the electoral college and becomes president. 270 is currently the number of electoral college votes needed. As of now, 15 states, including Colorado and the District of Columbia, have signed on with a total of 196 electoral college votes among them. So nothing will change right away, regardless of how Colorado votes on Proposition 113 in this election. But if Proposition 113 fails, our nine votes will no longer be counted for the NPVIC, dropping the number there to 187. Why is this important to Colorado beyond the small d democratic ideal of having the Democrat elected by the popular vote of the whole country? Well, there are several reasons. Right now, some states are considered reliably blue or red, meaning that it's fairly certain how their electoral college votes will be cast. These states are pretty much ignored by the presidential candidates who concentrate their time, effort, and money on the so-called swing states. Today, Colorado is no longer considered a real swing state, so the candidates don't focus on issues that are important to the people of Colorado, whether Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, or other. The candidates rarely visit Colorado, and they don't spend nearly as much money in Colorado during the campaign as they do in the swing states. This does affect our bottom line. In addition, and maybe most importantly, blue voters in a reliably red state or red voters in a reliably blue state almost may as well not vote for president at all since their votes have little chance of changing the way that state's electors vote at the electoral college. By state law, the electors will all vote for the blue presidential candidate in the reliably blue states and for the red candidate in the reliably red states. If the NPVIC were to take effect, every person's vote would count towards the national total and therefore everyone's vote would count. If the yes votes win on Proposition 113, Colorado's nine electoral college votes will remain in the NPVIC and once enough other states join to reach a total of 270, Colorado's electors will vote for the winner of the national popular vote rather than the winner of the Colorado popular vote as now. If the no votes win, the law passed by the legislature last year will be rescinded. 
Colorado's nine electoral vote votes will no longer count towards the needed 270, and our electors will continue to vote for the winner of the popular vote in Colorado. Thank you for your time. And regardless of how you end up deciding on this proposition, please vote in this truly important election and vote as much of the whole ballot, it's a long one, as you possibly can. Thank you very much. Jill, thank you. And now we will have Rose Puglisi present against uh, Proposition 113, the national popular vote. So Rose, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much. So my name is Rose Puglisi. I'm a Mesa County Commissioner and um, an opponent to the national popular vote. So during the 2019 legislative session, there were so many issues going through the legislature that year. But one day I'm walking down Main Street in Grand Junction and five people literally stopped me on my way to lunch that day to talk to me about what I was going to do to stop the national popular vote from coming into law in Colorado. And I'll be honest with you, this wasn't an issue that was on my radar. Um, so I talked to some people in Denver that I was friendly with about the issue and found out that Mayor Don Wilson of Monument had a very similar experience in Monument. And so with that, we decided to invoke a process that it's in Colorado's constitution. We're so fortunate to live in Colorado that allows the citizens to do a referendum, to put it on the ballot so that if um, a law passes that we do not believe is in the best interest of Coloradans, we have the opportunity to vote on that law. And this process hadn't been used in Colorado since 1932. So it's not a process that's invoked very often. We hit the ground running after the governor signed the bill into law and with over 2200 grassroots volunteers from all over Colorado, we were able to put this on the ballot. We needed just under um, 145,000 votes or signatures in order to make the ballot and we got over 228,000 signatures in what would turn out to be the largest bipartisan movement in Colorado's history to get a question on the ballot. And the reason that I think um, this issue was so personal to people is that these are their votes and they felt like they were taken away and they wanted to make sure that they had the ability to vote on this issue. I think Coloradans are in the best position to determine who, which presidential candidate will best serve Colorado's needs. I'm not convinced that Colorado is, is uh, not a swing state still. Uh, of course, I'm a Republican in rural Colorado. I do not feel disenfranchised. I do feel like my vote counts. And I believe very strongly that it is my job to influence my fellow Coloradans, as opposed to influence in influencing others in other states. So basically, um, as Jill had said, this will take Colorado's nine electoral college votes and give them to a compact of states, irregardless of how Colorado votes in the presidential election. So right now we have the popular vote in Colorado. Coloradans are in control of that decision as to who our nine electoral college votes might go. And that might not be the person that I voted for, but I still think it's important that we keep Colorado's votes in Colorado with Coloradans. Um, there are so many issues related to this. Every state has different campaign laws and different election laws. So theoretically, there could be a candidate on a ballot in a different state that's not on Colorado's ballot, and yet that person could get Colorado's nine electoral college votes. How is that in Colorado's best interest? We're in the best position to decide where Colorado's votes for president should go. Um, we are not a direct, direct democracy. The founders didn't establish us that way. Um, the United States is a representative republic and this system allows people to again influence their neighbors and their friends as opposed to a compact of states. Um, additionally, Basically, presidential candidates will go to the higher population centers. That's where the votes are. We see that in Western Colorado all the time. The votes are on the front range. We've had gubernatorial candidates and senatorial candidates who have refused to participate in um, rural Colorado's Club 20 debates because the votes are just simply not here. Now exasperate that to a national level. Colorado would have no voice and no vote. And right now um, we do have influence. We have seen candidates on both the Democratic and Republican side come all over Colorado to talk to us about issues. We have a lot of influence over national policy issues such as transportation, infrastructure, water, which is really important as a Chamber of Commerce to the business community. 
The other thing I want to point out from a business perspective is that the states that are currently in the compact are blue states um, and they have business unfriendly policies and high tax policies and they potentially could be controlling the votes for president. And what would that look like for national policy? Colorado would no longer be um, a great influence. And so we're basically ceding our voice and our vote and our influence to larger population centers, which we do not believe is in the best interest of Coloradans. And neither did the 2200 grassroots volunteers and the 228,000 plus people who signed the petition to put this on the ballot. So we're asking for a no vote on 113. Keep Colorado's votes for president in Colorado with Coloradans. That is what is in the best interest of Colorado. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate being able to talk to the business community in Durango today. Thank you. Rose, thank you. And um, we do have one question that came up and either uh, Rose or Jill might be able to answer this. The question is, are there other states that currently have the issue on their ballot that will increase the number of electoral votes joining the MPV Interstate Compact in this election cycle? I'd be happy to take that question, Jill. Go ahead. Okay. Um, no, so Colorado is so unique in that our Constitution actually allows the people of Colorado, as opposed to our legislature on, on this specific issue, to vote um, because of our referendum process. Not every state, um, I actually don't know of other states that do have that referendum process in their Constitution. So the states that are currently in the compact do have um, their legislature, legislatures had voted in their governors had passed it, except for Nevada, where they're uh, in the 2019 legislative session, the legislature passed it, but the governor vetoed it, saying it was not in the best interest of Nevada. But otherwise, um, every state legislature, not the people, have had the uh, ability to put states into the compact, um, except for Colorado, because our constitution is so unique. So thank you for that question. Thank you for answering it. Um, Jill, go ahead. Well, as I understand it, there are several states, and I'm sorry, I cannot tell you which ones there are, which, what their names are, but there are several states who are currently um, considering this. And so there is, sorry, there's a, the video. <laughs> um, so th there is a possibility, um, albeit somewhat remote, that this could actually take effect by the election of 2024. Um, it, that would be the, the earliest it would be likely to happen. But yes, it, it could happen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, um, we will now put our poll out, whether you're for, against, or still undecided. So I'll have our Zoom moderator uh, go ahead and put the poll out. And we will close the poll here in five, four, three, two, one. I'll end the polling and we'll share the results. Very close. Very interesting. 31% percent Four, 33% against, and 37 still undecided. Very interesting. Obviously, we uh, need to do some more research and um, uh, with the undecided votes and educate ourselves with uh, what is needed in order to become more familiar with this so we can make, um, make our vote count, as they say. All right, we'll move on to Amendment B, and our first presenter is Simon Lomack. He's EIS Solutions Senior Advisor, um, and he is going to talk about for the Gallagher reform. Simon, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. How's my audio? Is it coming through clear? Okay, terrific. Um, well, listen, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to come speak with you. Um, I was uh, asked by the uh, Yes on Amendment B campaign to uh, present the findings of a report that, um, that I worked with um, 
that I worked on with a number of uh, business groups from across the state, um, and I'll get to those findings um, in a minute. So uh, my role is as a sort of policy advisor to, uh, to those business groups and also to the Yes on Amendment B campaign when it comes to you know, trying to make sense of your Colorado's rather elaborate property tax uh, system and how it has been impacted over the last four decades by uh, the Gallagher Amendment. And in particular, the focus on my work, which I know is very near and dear to your hearts, is what the impact of the, the Gallagher Amendment has been um, on, uh, on business and what the business impacts will be if Amendment B fails and the Gallagher formula resets yet again next year at about a level 18% below its current level for that residential uh, assessment rate. Um, so, uh, Jack, I'm not sure if I can share my screen. You can. I have you should be able to at the bottom there. Yes. Okay. Terrific. I'll start with the I'll start with the headline finding. Provide a little bit of background and then try to go through the um, uh, sort of the steps that we took and the and the research that we conducted in order to, to to get to that finding. So first, let me share this browser. Okay. Does everybody see? My we screen, I'm always, really, I'm always kind of lousy at screen sharing, sorry. We're good. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, uh, the report, which was um, uh, issued by NFIB Colorado, which is you know, uh, the leading small business uh, association, both nationally and uh, it has um, uh, chapters in every, uh, every state of the country. Um, the Boulder Chamber, the Colorado Springs Chamber, and EDC, and, and Colorado Concern. And so uh, what uh, the report finds is that um, if Amendment B fails and the Gallagher formula uh, resets um, as expected next year, the uh, tax increase on uh, business owners and other job creators across Colorado will be something uh, in the range of $250 million dollars to $270 million. And uh, that really will be driven by a, uh, a, what, uh, a continuation or an acceleration of the trend of what the Gallagher Amendment has done um, to, uh, to property taxes uh, in, in the state of Colorado. And that is, it has, especially in, in the last you know, uh, five to 10 years, it has really pushed more and more of the property tax burden in local communities Onto, uh, onto businesses such that they now pay roughly four times what other property owners pay in, uh, in uh, property taxes. And next year, uh, that is going to escalate to five times if Amendment B, uh, if Amendment B fails. Um, so that's, the, that's sort of the headline right there. Um, I will show you some uh, material from the report itself in a second, but uh, let me just say that um, by way of background, the, the property tax question in general is really important um, because property taxes are the way that, uh, they're the biggest source of funding for you know, the local services that we, that we all use every day and that you know, maybe we take them for granted, but they're the hardest services to sort of live without. And I'm talking, of course, about schools and fire departments and parks and rec, you know, local public works departments, um, and, uh, and of course, you know, water and sewer infrastructure. You know, all of that, the most reliable source of, of funding for those services uh, is, uh, is, is the property tax. And um, as, as people in, in Durango and La Plata County know, um, very well, um, you know, this is, uh, there are real costs to providing those services and those services, the costs for those services don't magically disappear every time the Gallagher formula uh, resets lower and lower and lower. And so those costs don't disappear, they just get shifted somewhere else. And so what we have seen um, over the years is it being shifted from residential property to you know, restaurants and shops and office buildings and farms and movie theaters and all kinds of, of other businesses. 
And so one of the reasons why there is this sort of groundswell, I think, of uh, support for it repealing uh, the Gallagher Amendment, which was passed in 1982, and it was kind of the brainchild of, you know, then Democratic State Senator Dennis Gallagher, um, who later went on to become the, the auditor of the city and county of Denver. Um, uh, one of the reasons why there is this groundswell of support is that um, the, 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 the workings of this statewide formula really take local control away from communities about how they want to structure their property tax bases. Um, because the formula of Gallagher essentially uh, right now says that the residential rate is 7.15% and the, uh, and, and the non-residential rate is, is 29%. That's the four times difference. Um, if it goes to five times, um, uh, then, uh, then local communities are going to be faced with this sort of impossible choice of, well, either we have to cut our uh, budgets for these essential services because our, our, our tax base has been reduced by this state formula, or we're going to have to uh, increase uh, mill levies in order to basically you know, uh, prevent those losses or catch up with those losses after they've happened, basically to, to hold steady. But because of the way the Gallagher formula works, those mill levy increases are disproportionately paid for at a rate of four to one today and next year five to one um, by business. And so the, the findings of the report that the Yes on campaign, the Yes on B campaign asked me to walk through um, basically talks about what those impacts, uh, what those impacts will uh, are likely to be. So going back to my screen. Uh, the report was issued on Monday, and it's called Iceberg Ahead, the Hidden Tax Increase Below the Surface of the Gallagher Formula. As I said, it's sponsored by uh, NFIB, the Bold Chamber, the Colorado Springs Chamber in EDC, and, and Colorado Concern. And I will take you to the executive summary, and uh, after uh, I'm done, I will put the links uh, to these materials in the chat so you can go and look at it yourself. Um, and I really would encourage you to spend some time um, uh, because uh, you know th this this report has been you know uh, a lot of uh, time in the making um, because what we discovered is because the property tax system in Colorado is is so you know complex and so diffuse um, uh, because there are about four four thousand four thousand five hundred um, special districts across the state that have you know mill levy authority. Um, no one has really ever uh, tried to work out, well, how much of the uh, mill levy, uh, how, how many automatic mill levy increases are there out there that will be triggered by Gallagher next year once the residential rate ratchets down? Simon, 30 seconds, then we'll wrap seconds. up. Okay, for sure. So I'll take you to the executive summary. And uh, what it says is that next year, because of automatic mill levy adjustments, school mill levy overrides, repayments on bonds, all of those mill levies that actually flow, that aren't fixed or pre-authorized by voters to increase. The, uh, the, the tax increase on businesses is about 254 million at a minimum and could be as high as about 270 million because there are a number of additional mill levy um, increase, uh, sorry, automatic mill levies uh, on the ballot. Uh, this November all, all across the state. And one last point, uh, these floating mill levies, what we found is they are uh, present in counties where more than 90% of Coloradans live. So some form of your property tax base for more than 90% of all the people across the state has a floating element to it because of efforts to kind of counteract this, uh, this impact of, of Gallagher on, uh, especially on the tax burden on businesses. So uh, thank you, Jack, for, uh, for, for, the, for the warning, and I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> hand over to you. Yeah, thank you for uh, presenting in your time and joining us this morning. Uh, for Amendment B, Gallagher Reform, um, we have Alex Lemmel will present. Um, Alex, will have you come up on the screen here. And again, thank you for being here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to immediately start with sharing my screen. Please let me know uh, if you cannot see it. 
Um, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer. I am with the League of Women Voters of La Plata County, and I actually support yes on Amendment B. So you might be asking why am I about to argue against it? Um, and it's pretty simple. Tax reform is not um, a yes or no answer. Um, Amendment B is far from perfect legislation. Its weaknesses deserve to be addressed head on. Um, I will put a quick plug tonight. Uh, the League, as well as Fort Lewis College, is putting on a virtual ballot issue form tonight. So you can go to our website if you want more information on that. Right, so I think it's important to talk about the Gallagher Amendment, why and how it works. Um, sorry, the basics. Um, the assessment rate is what gets applied. Um, and this is what the Gallagher Amendment legislates. Um, a mill levy is the tax rate that is applied to your taxable value. So that's one a thousandth or 0.001%. Um, the property taxes are determined by local governments. Uh, that's what you vote on. They do primarily fund education, fire protection, sanitation and libraries. And because of Tabor, you do actually have to vote on the mill levies to increase them. Um, so the property tax calculation at um, its most simplest is your market value times your assessment rate times your mill levy. Currently on a property value that's 350,000 with a 7.15% assessment rate, that's the current one, times a 35 mill levy, you'll have a property tax bill of $876. So why and how it works. Um, property taxes were skyrocketing in the 1970s. Um, residential market values increased 1% per month for a straight decade. Um, the Gallagher Amendment was the legislative solution and it passed in 1982 with broad support, um, I think two to one actually, uh, and that it, for informational purposes, that was 10 years before Tabor. Um, it changed how and when assessment rates are updated and we'll focus more on the how today. Um, and it is a good idea. It does keep home buying more affordable. There's a lot of evidence for that. So on the how, it set a ratio of property tax dollars collected from residential and commercial. 45% um, of total property value was residential, the remaining 55% commercial. That was in 1982. Um, so what they did was assess, make an assessment rate of 21% um, that was allowed to fluctuate and is set by the state every two years and commercial is at 29% rate. That always stays the same. So just to show an example for residential 1982 and commercial 1982, um, the commercial property would be paying 3,500, the residential 2,500. All right. Oh, sorry. So why, so why no? Um, you will pay more dollars in property tax if your home value increases. Um, the detractors ask, who will those increases be passed along to? Um, and there are still exemptions for veterans and senior citizens, um, which I think has been an argument we hear a lot of. Um, so here's an example of what yes on amendment B looks like. Your property value increases from 350 to 380. Um, everything else stays the same. So your tax bill goes from 876 to 951. Um, no one amendment B, says that the assessment rate is likely to drop. Um, we're not sure what the drop will be, but um, that will keep your tax bill constant. Um, voters can and have voted to increase mill levies in their districts. Um, there is low trust in the legislator. Um, I think one of the most strong arguments you'll see is that there are already special interest groups um, pressuring the legislator to cut the commercial rate from its current 29% rate to provide relief to small business. Um, I have that arrow because in combination with Tabor, that would be catastrophic to the state budget. Um, that's a precipice that once we fall off of, uh, we're gonna just be free falling um, in debt for um, as long as possible. It's a very short-term fix. So, you know, a long, I think that most people agree that a long-term solution is needed, but it needs to address Tabor and regional specifics as well. Um, a simple repeal is not necessarily the best possible answer. 
Um, I think there, people think that this could be a partisan issue. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan opposition. So, I mean, I think to uh, reiterate, the namesake Dennis Gallagher is a Democrat. He's defended this legislation. Former Speaker of the House, Dickie Lee Hollenkirst, has came out against it. And a lot for the reasons that um, it does uh, increase the, the property tax and people are worried that's gonna be passed on to renters who are already vulnerable um, to increased uh, rental rates every year. Um, as well as uh, the interest of commercial, um, commercial special interests trying to reduce that 29%, which again, once that 29% is reduced, uh, it will need to go through uh, a vote uh, to increase it again, uh, which from what we already know is very difficult to do across the state. All right, and that is all I have. Get my, get my button, bright, bright buttons pushed. So thank you uh, very much, Alex, for presenting. Um, I, I do want to read a couple comments from Durango Fire. It says, if Amendment B fails, the Gallagher adjusts as projected, Durango Fire Rescue will lose $817,000 of revenue annually. Uh, nine our schools, La Plata County government, and other special districts stand to lose critical funding to provide service in our region. The only option left for tax-funded districts to make up the lost revenue is to increase our mill levy, shifting more of the tax burden to business owners who already pay four times the tax rate of residential property owners. Without a Gallagher repeal, five times the burden, tax burden will be thrust upon the business community. So thank you for um, kind of putting some, uh, um, you know, actualities behind what this will do. Uh, there is a question, if Gallagher is repealed, would the result be similar to the proposition in California, which has made residential property taxes so high? So Simon or Alex, would either of you like yeah. to feel that question? Simon? Yeah, I could, um, I think I can answer that. Um, I'm just trying to start my video again so you can see me. There we go. Hi again. Um, so the answer to the question is, um, is no, it would not. And the reason is that um, uh, the, uh, if Amendment B passes, then the 7.15% um, residential assessment rate statewide um, is frozen in place and it cannot be increased uh, without a vote of uh, without a vote of the people, um, because of Tabor, and so one of the things that uh, one of the reasons why the, the the one of the things about the Gallagher Amendment that I think is not really well sort of understood, because is is that it actually predated uh, Tabor by by ten years, and I, and I thank Alex for pointing that out in in his presentation. So while at the time it may have made sense because you know residential property owners really didn't have um, uh, protections over you know mill levy increases and things like that, and they didn't have a say. They they have that now because of Tabor, and so any attempt to increase the residential assessment rate at the state level would be would be subject um, to a vote. The other thing that I think is really important to remember, and it's kind of been lost in the shuffle in this whole discussion, is that you know uh, the effective property tax rate in in Colorado um, is. Uh, when you compare it to other states, is about the third lowest in the country. And so Amendment B essentially freezes residential rates at that very, very low rate. However, when you look at the commercial side of things, because of all of the tax burden, all of the tax base that has been shifted onto businesses um, because, of, uh, because of the Gallagher Amendment, Colorado has some of the highest effective commercial property tax rates uh, in the country. So, you know, basically we, we have a current system right now where we tax, you know, we tax residential property like we're Wyoming and we tax commercial property like we're New Jersey. Um, and so there are cities in, in Colorado that actually have, you know, almost double the effective commercial property tax rate than cities like New York, Washington, DC, uh, Los Angeles. And, um, and so uh, Amendment B, is um, a great first step towards 
um, I, you know, just speaking for myself, I, I think it's a great first step towards um, coming up with a better uh, property tax uh, formula for the state. Um, however, um, trying to do more than just freeze what we have right now, I think, especially in this economy, would be incredibly unfair to business owners and job creators because essentially they would be negotiating under severe duress because they're basically saying, well, do you want to go to five times or do you want to go to six times the next time the Gallagher formula resets instead of freezing everything in place and then allowing a, a more rational, you know, um, calmer discussion about how to, um, uh, about how to make sure that we do the right thing by residential property owners, which is incredibly important, but also that we do the right thing by the people who we need right now to be out there, you know, investing in our state and creating jobs and putting people back to work and sending them dramatically higher tax bills and hundreds of millions of dollars higher tax bills in the middle of this recession um, uh, is uh, perhaps not the best idea to say the least. Thank you. At this time now we will um, issue the poll and let's just see, I'm just checking something. Uh, here we go with the poll. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, you're voting. Will you be voting for or against Amendment B? Uh, voting uh, for the uh, reform or against the reform? And we'll go here for a little bit longer. Um, I can, my own, uh, this is Jack talking, but I know Gallagher reform has been needed for quite some time. It's been talked about and talked about and talked about. So we'll end the polling here in five, four, three, two, one. In the polling, and I will share the results where 64% are in favor, 18% uh, against, and 18% undecided. So um, thank you everybody for that input. And again, I do think that uh, a Gallagher, Gallagher reform uh, is needed. And um, this will definitely have an impact uh, as was mentioned earlier, if it does not pass. Um, check something real quick. There is a question. Um, I'll go ahead and ask it since we're okay on time. Are we able to vote to raise mill levies and increase rates to even things out between residential and commercial to gain funding for essential infrastructure services and still maintain sustainable affordability. Um, Simon, would you like to answer that one? Um, I certainly can, but uh, Alex, do you want to take a uh, first stab at that? Yeah, I, I will take a first stab at that. Um, so I think that's a uh, complex question, but, um, I mean, you're not going to be able to even things out unless the commercial assessment rate falls. Um, so uh, as Simon mentioned, that 29% um, is what the commercial rate is. Uh, repealing Amendment B locks uh, the residential rate at 7.15%. That four times ratio um, is really always going to be there. Um, so if you raise a mill levy, that mill levy is still going to be have four times an impact on commercial businesses than it will on residential businesses. So um, I think, and I mistakenly uh, answered a previous question, but um, Terry Hutchinson asked if the commercial tax rate is lowered, where would our funds come from? And that's where you would need to increase mill levies. So. Um, if you decrease the commercial tax rate and increase the levies, you might have more parity. Yeah, I, I would just echo that um, uh, earlier I, I made a reference to the, the Gallagher formula sort of um, imposing a, um, 
imp imposing kind of the state's will on local communities in terms of how different classes of property are taxed. And that's exactly what Alex is getting at in his answer, that, that um, uh, it, it's not just that, you know, you have a commercial ass assessment rate and you have a residential assessment rate. It's the difference between the two that also makes a huge difference. Um, sometimes when I'm sort of talking about this to, you know, friends and family, I talk about, you know, the state formula tries to shrink the property tax base and that forces local governments to increase the property tax base at the local level. It's like squeezing one end of a balloon and the other end gets bigger. But the, diff the difference is that Gallagher changes who pays. And, um, and I think a lot of times where communities have, you know, voted to de-Gallagher or revenue stabilize, those are sometimes, you know, terms that you, that, you, that you hear, where they've said voters will pre-authorize mill levies at the local level to adjust in order to, you know, counter this Gallagher, you know, uh, impact. Um, uh, what has been sort of not talked about a lot in those discussions is that businesses are picking up most of that tax increase. Essentially, 83% of that tax increase under a five to one ratio Will come from will come from business, and so that's why at this moment in this economy, you see so many different you know business organizations all across the state saying, "Look, Gallagher has you know solved the the, the 70s and early 80s problem of skyrocketing tax uh, rates on on residential owners. We've we're now the third lowest in the country, but now the roles have been reversed, and now the now the businesses have the really really high commercial." property tax rates effectively and, and we just can't keep you know pushing in one direction we have to stop and freeze things where they are and then and then work out the best way forward. Great thank you both for uh, answering that question and uh, uh, reiterating that you know roughly eight percent tax on uh, residential and 29 percent tax on business and uh, the, the equity is uh, imbalanced. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and move forward on to Proposition 118, the pan, uh, paid family medical leave. We'll have Deborah Brown and Karen Mullivan present on this issue. And with that, uh, Deborah, are you going first? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'll mute one more time. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> we are good to go. All right, just gonna share my screen real quick. Well, thank you so much um, for having us, Jack, and, and to the Durango Chamber for putting this event on. It's a pleasure to talk with you all today. My name is Deborah Brown. I'm the Executive Director of Good Business Colorado. We're in an organization of values-driven businesses advocating for a prosperous economy, equitable communities, and a sustainable environment. I had the great pleasure of being in Durango just a week ago today to meet with our members and talk to business owners about Proposition 118. So big shout out to Local First, our partner on the ground there in Durango. So what is paid family medical leave? So we find that um, the biggest concerns around Prop 118 is really a lack of understanding of what the policy is and how it will impact businesses directly. So we just wanna take some time to make sure everybody is familiar with what Proposition 118 actually is and what it will do. So it provides compensation for time off from work due to major life events, such as the birth of a child or a serious illness, caretaking responsibilities for a dying parent, and it's different than regular paid time off. So a lot of businesses provide paid sick days uh, for short-term illnesses and vacation time, but that's not what we're talking about with paid family and medical leave in Proposition 118. So why does this matter? I'm sure everybody on this call can share a story where either you or somebody um, in your network has either been able to take the time they needed to care for themselves, to take paternity or maternity leave, or somebody who didn't have the ability to take the time off work after being in a car accident, receiving a cancer diagnosis. And whether or not somebody has access to paid leave has a major 
impact on their future earning abilities and their financial stability. Here in Colorado, there's over 80% of the population that does not currently have access to paid family and medical leave. And as I'm sure all of you know, FMLA for businesses that have more than 50 employees only provides unpaid leave, which for many people is like having no leave at all because they literally cannot risk um, taking that time off work unpaid. We know everyone gets sick, so this really is a policy that is consistent with what we know about the human experience. So we always like to ask um, people, and we'd love to invite anyone who's interested in having a deeper conversation about Prop 118, paid family and medical leave after this presentation to reach out to us. But we always like to get a sense of what people are currently able to do. We don't have time to do that today, but would really encourage you to reach out to us to talk to us about what you currently do or do not have in place for your employees and how Proposition 118 will impact you. So how exactly does the program work? If Colorado voters approve it, it will create a statewide insurance program. And the idea is that together employees and employers will share the cost of a program that everybody will benefit from equally. So businesses with fewer than 10 employees, they actually don't have to pay the premium. They certainly can if they wanna be competitive or to um, just do that for their employees. They do have the ability to in, uh, pay for their employee share, but um, they do not have to. And that's really important, especially for the smallest businesses to have that flexibility. Um, the, the employees of an employee with 10 or less employees still do pay into the program and they still get that benefit um, if they have a qualified leave where they need to utilize it. So again, the purpose of this is at Good Business Colorado, our members have been working on paid family and medical leave pretty much since the inception of our organization. And it's really because our members understand the importance of being able to provide paid leave. Um, thankfully, we're no longer at a point where we were even five years ago as a nation and here in Colorado where we were debating the merits of paid family and medical leave. There's enough evidence out there and people know just from their own experiences that it enables them to compete for talent with larger corporations. It helps them to retain employees, decreases turnover, and that employees who have access to paid leave are more productive. And we're even seeing a lot of really great data coming out now that's showing that businesses that do provide paid family and medical leave outperform their competitors financially. So thankfully we're not in a place where we're still debating whether or not it makes sense to provide paid family and medical leave. So the question really becomes what's the best way to do it? And we've seen very clearly that what is currently available through the private market is not working. Um, it's simply not accessible um, or affordable and it doesn't provide the type of coverage that our businesses need to be able to provide their employees with the the type of leave that really um, is what's needed in today's world where you have the sandwich generation taking care of aging parents and um, young children and people increasingly fighting with uh, cancer and other illnesses that require them to leave the workforce temporarily and then come back to work more productive and financially secure so they can focus on helping us to grow our businesses. And that's really what the point of this social insurance program is. And so what exactly are the um, components of the policy? So it will provide up to 12 weeks of leave, an additional four weeks for qualifying pregnancy as necessary. But again, this is uh, only the necessary amount of time. So first of all, we know just historically in, in places that have these programs in place that people only take as much leave as they need. First of all, it's not 100% wage replacement, so there's a financial incentive to get back to work as quickly as possible. But again, if you have an injury where you have a surgery that requires one week of recuperation, that is what you would qualify for. Um, and same with every single, every single qualified leave, you're only taking the amount of time off that is um, approved. Um, and another thing that's really important is we know we have members and we know that there are businesses across the state that are already providing really robust programs. We really commend them uh, for being able to do that and think that they absolutely should be able to continue doing so. So any business that has a 
private insurance plan or is self-insuring can absolutely continue to do so um, by as long as their plan meets the state certification for the minimum um, benefits. And workers become eligible for leave after earning $2,500 in wages, which is the same as unemployment insurance. And um, they're only eligible for job protection after being with the company for half a year, or 180 days of employment. The premiums will begin being collected in January of 23. And then after a year of building up um, the revenues, we'll be able to begin paying out benefits in January of 2024. And with that, I'll kick it over to Karen. Thanks, everybody. I just saw the warning one minute left, so I'm going to have to talk fast. Uh, Deborah, if you can advance the slide. This next slide is just about where sort of uh, concepts and, and this link from. Um, Folks may know the legislature did pass a legislative task force last session where an extremely diverse group studied this issue. They looked at the models that eight other states have um, put into place and studied these 16 components of what other states have done, what's working, how we could conceivably build a program in Colorado. Very diverse group, everything from you know the ski industry, big business, small business, restaurants, um, labor economists studied these 16 components. There was an enormous amount of consensus, which surprised a lot of folks. And the framework that this legislative task force built is what we see in uh, this policy and what's going to be on your ballot. Next slide. Oh my God. About 30 mm -hmm. seconds. Okay, I will talk fast. I just want to be sure folks understand before we wrap up the cost. Um, if you could go back, Deborah. Um, again, the um, Small businesses with 10 or less do not have to pay into the premium. The amount is set. Deborah, if you could do the previous slide. Um, here we go. So for businesses that do have more than, um, they've got 11 or more employees, then the contribution weight, it's 0.9% of an employee wage. So 0.45% each. That's the rate for 2023 and 2024. Again, if you're a smaller business that doesn't have that many employees, you're not paying anything into it. Your employee will um, have 0.45% of their wage deducted. Uh, that rate could be adjusted after 2025, but the ballot measure does state that the rate cannot exceed 1.2% of a wage. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see if you look at these weekly amounts depending on folks salary it's kind of small medium large coffee right um, is what people are paying into this program and then if they do face a medical crisis they would be able to recover and get their salary replaced um, while they need to focus on their medical care or focus on their family um, they paid into the program so they would get their wage replaced um, by by being able to access the funds uh, so I think we're probably out of time. Um, so I will just wrap up there. Uh, we've got a big list of endorsing organizations, a big list of endorsing businesses, and we're happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. I'll let it run over a little bit, so <laughs> we're, we're fine. Those of you that go, that was a long 30 seconds. I was timing it and I let it go ahead and uh, run a little longer. Um, now we will have Christy Pollard uh, presenting uh, against Proposition 118, the paid medical leave. And stop share. And with that, Christy, it's all yours. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, this morning uh, for the opportunity to uh, visit with you and to share with you a little bit more about um, why we are asking voters to vote no on Proposition 118. So let me grab my slide presentation here so that I can share my screen. Great. Uh, so I uh, appreciate again the time. Um, so I'm here this morning to share with you um, why we would like voters to vote no on Proposition 118. Um, and as one, what was indicated before about the premise is absolutely true. As Coloradans, we do understand the importance of paid family and medical leave. As a mom of four, I know firsthand the importance of moms uh, bonding with their children. 
Um, also, as a small business owner, I understand the importance of my employees and the importance of taking care of them during their time of need. Um, what we are arguing today is not the premise of paid family leave, but the details of what is actually inside Initiative 118, which is actually the most uh, generous program in the United States. Um, you see here a statement by the Colorado Women's Chamber who supports business uh, businesses owned by women and women issues all across the state opposing it. And I think they very nicely articulate exactly what I just said. We are also joined by uh, over 50 business organizations representing thousands of businesses across the state and asking voters to vote no on Proposition 118. So let's dig in a little bit into the details of Proposition 118. So uh, Proposition 118 uh, is a new $1.3 billion tax increase that authorizes a new department in, at the state of Colorado, which will be overseen by a political appointee. That $1.3 billion tax will be split evenly between the employer and the employee, and each employee will see the deduction on their paycheck uh, every time they get paid. It'll be similar to a FICA tax or that Social Security deduction. And again, as was indicated before, this uh, program allows uh, eligible employees to take uh, 12 to 16 weeks off to care for themselves. Um, or a non-family member. Um, I do think it's important though to point out that the definition um, of whom a person can take leave for is also the broadest in the nation and includes uh, individuals with which the employee has a significant bond. It's also important to point out that this leave does not have to be taken consecutively. It can happen uh, every Friday, every Monday uh, for up to 12 weeks based on the circumstances that the employee may have. We're concerned about the ballot language uh, that voters are going to be asked because it is deceptive. Um, it calls this a payroll premium when in fact it is a tax. Uh, on an employee's paycheck, it actually is equivalent to a 20% increase in their uh, income tax. And for employers, uh, by 2025, uh, this would be uh, an increase of the corporate income tax at the state level of 204%. So let's talk a little bit more about what else this program does in addition to providing time off and uh, leave benefits for employees. This initiative also creates a massive new bureaucracy at the state level. Uh, the department will hire up to 196 new employees and again will be overseen by a political appointee who will promulgate the rules uh, and will be the individual who will make the determination as to whether or not um, the uh, circumstances are approved, whether employers are exempt, etc. Um, this program is also exempt, uh, revenue sources are exempt uh, under TABOR, uh, which means that the political appointee will be able to increase that deduction from 0.9 to 1.2 uh, at any point uh, that they believe is necessary. The other concern with this program is that employers and employees will start paying into this program for a full year before benefits will be available. The other piece of it is that if just 6.2% of Coloradans use this benefit, it will be bankrupt by year two. This uh, information uh, was recently released in a report, an economic impact report by the Common Sense Institute, which is a nonpartisan business think tank that evaluates different policy issues in Colorado. So again, uh, just 6.2% of Coloradans using this program, it will be bankrupt in year two. And the challenge is you will have employees who will be counting on these monies that they've been paying into for at least two years at this point. And with the time that they need it the most, uh, the question is, will the monies actually be available for them? The other piece of this initiative, which is, is interesting, is that uh, 
this exempts all local government. So cities, towns, school districts, special districts, um, all employers are exempt from this. The employees still do pay into it, um, but it's because they cannot afford it and because uh, the state cannot give them unfunded mandates. Um, my question would be during a time of uh, recession and during a time that we are all recovering from a worldwide pandemic, uh, can we afford it as small businesses as well? The other piece that is important to uh, dig into and understand, and it was referenced before, we have many employers all across the state who are extremely generous and already offer a paid family and leave benefit. In order for that employer to be exempt under this program, the benefits have to be exact. Um, to those in the initiative, including the broadened definition of family, the amount of leave, and the amount of pay. Um, it, so again, it has to be exact or exceed that, and the political appointee will be the individual who will make the determination as to whether or not uh, uh, the private programs uh, meet those circumstances. And I don't have to, you know, belabor the point with all of you on the phone. You are small businesses uh, who are doing great things in southwestern Colorado. Um, the reality is, is that as a state and as a nation, uh, we are hurting. We are in an economic recession, unlike one that we've ever seen since the Great Depression. We have over 4,000 restaurants that have closed permanently. We have millions of dollars in tourism dollars that have been lost and uh, we will still remain to be seen whether they'll be recovered. The question is, is now the time to be adding a $1.3 billion tax increase on the backs of those employers and employees who are still struggling to come back and to get people back into the labor force. So that's why I'm asking you today uh, to vote no on Proposition 118. It's a $1.3 billion tax increase that creates a new massive bureaucracy and we question whether or not uh, it can be solvent, we believe it will be destined for bankruptcy if just 6.2% of Coloradans use it. So with that, thank you for the opportunity and very happy to answer questions. Thank you. And we do have one question, a comment first, and then the question at the end. So it's, uh, Proposition 118 would create a new tax that represents a 20%, excuse me, 20% increase on income tax further hurting individuals and small businesses struggling to recover from COVID-19. A recent economic impact study completed by the Common Sense Institute found that by year two, the program would bankrupt if only 6.2% of Coloradans use up to 9.5 weeks of leave. As an employee, could you be paying into a program that may not have sufficient funding by the time you should ever need it? forcing our state lawmakers to make cuts in education, transportation, and other state needs to fund the program. Can you address this very important funding shortfall? And I'll let both of you respond. And with that, who would like to respond first? Um, Karen, would you like to? Sure. I mean, I, what I can share is that, you know, I, I do really understand and appreciate the concerns around financial solvency, and that's certainly something we've looked a lot at as well. Um, as I mentioned, there are eight other states that have passed very similar programs. This is modeled after uh, the really diverse states, everything from California to Rhode Island, and in between New Jersey, uh, Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Um, and I will say that none of the states that have had these programs have experienced solvency issues. New Jersey um, actually recently expanded their program. They were able to do that because of um, the, the resources and modeling that had been done and the success that the program has had. Um, so we, we don't see that in other states. I mean, I, I do agree, none of us have a crystal ball. So none of us can say exactly what um, utilization will look like in our state, but we do have eight other states to look at that have successfully built these programs. And as I mentioned, a legislative task force did study this issue extensively. There were reports issued by University of Minnesota, Urban Institute, DU, all looking at solvency and a finan financial actuarial um, was brought in, a Miami-based firm that just studies um, 
solvency and utilization in finances and did rate this program with, I believe, an 86% solvency um, rate so that, that this was the right amount. So, um, so the rates are set so that they will not be able to skyrocket um, based on what we've seen in other states, based on the extensive research that has been done. We think this is, this is a place that the state can comfortably start with and to be able to provide this benefit. Great, and thank you for the question. I think it's a really important question that the voters educate themselves around. Uh, the Common Sense Institute also looked at the eight other states providing these and used that as, uh, their, as part of their analysis. And I think it's important to note that these other eight states, um, you're not comparing apples to apples. Again, this program that's being proposed in Colorado is the most generous of all benefits. Um, and the question is, if just 6.2% of Coloradans use it, it will be bankrupt in two years. The actuarial analysis that was done by this uh, uh, task force that was referenced was just 5.3%. So if the numbers are off by just 1%, it will be bankrupt. I think it's imp also important to point out that this has been going through the legislature for the last six years. And we know that we have had one party controlling the House, the Senate, and the governor's mansion, and they've not been able to agree on the numbers. And I think that is very, very important. The numbers don't lie. And it's something that we as voters need to take into consideration as we're thinking through um, possibly the unintended consequences behind this initiative. Great, thank you. We do have one other question and it's um, a short uh, probably answer, but how long have the other states had this program? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of variation. I wouldn't be able to tell you the years. California, my understanding, Deborah jump in, has uh, been around the longest. Um, New York has had a program, again, New Jersey, Rhode Island, um, Massachusetts, Washington State, Oregon are newer um, and, and just more getting off the ground, but there is some variation. California, I believe, is our longest standing program. The one thing I would just add to that is, uh, and, and yes, California is the longest standing. Um, the California statute and Washington statute uh, does have a provision within it, though, that their legislature um, can adjust rates annually. This particular initiative does not have any off-road for rate adjustment or benefit adjustments, which I believe could create uh, some conundrums uh, going forward. Um. Deborah, would you like to comment? There you go. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so actually there's an annual process by which they will evaluate and set the rates after the initial two-year period. So I'm not sure what your, there's an annual process to review the rates. Thank you. At this time, we'll go ahead and uh, conduct the poll, whether you are uh, for or against Proposition 118 paid family medical leave, and the poll has been initiated. We have a few more seconds here. And with that, we'll close the polling in five, four, three, two, and a couple more sneaking in and we'll end the polling and we'll go ahead and uh, share the okay. results. And four is 12%, 75% against with 14% still undecided. So um, from my opinion, not, not surprising coming from uh, the small businesses that are uh, attending today's event. Um, well, first off, I uh, would like to thank all of our panelists again for participating. Uh, a reminder, there are 11 ballot initiatives from Colorado as well as one here locally for the school district. So please make sure that uh, um, you do the research, uh, especially understanding uh, all of the ones that we've highlighted, which is just three of them and uh, ballots have been mailed out. So make sure you're checking your mailboxes, take the time to vote. Also, thank you to the League of Women Voters and again, all of the panelists. Uh, if you need to, to do the research, you can always pick up a blue book or go online. I was remiss earlier 
And this is my, my technology, technically challenging. I would like to thank Bank of Colorado. I neglected to thank them as our key sponsor for eggs and issues at the beginning. I had some things we were working on behind the scenes as well as Area Association of Realtors, uh, DAR, Durango Area Association of Realtors, without their continued support uh, with Bank of Colorado and DAR, we would not be able to conduct uh, our eggs and issues as well as other events. Um, you can go to DurangoBusiness.org and check out all of our upcoming events uh, that we will be having. And if there's anything that you need during the COVID, uh, we can, we're here to help you and we can connect you. With that, we're going to wrap it up uh, with this uh, eggs and issues. Again, thank you, everybody. And the most important thing is, excuse me, remember to vote. Have a great day.